So, uh, good morning. Um, now for something at least a little bit different, if not completely different. Uh, so, I come out of a computer science department and my area of interest is visualization. Um, and so in today's talk, I'm going to talk about some principles of visualization that are of interest not only generically for all of us, but particularly for visualization of networks, which may well be of interest to lots of people in this room. Um, so let me start with the definition. When I say vis, what do I mean? Uh, specifically, that computer-based visualization systems provide visual representations of data sets intended to help people carry out some task more effectively. Now, what are the implications of that sentence? Um, one is that there's data and there's people. And in particular, that there is some human in the loop that needs the details. There are a lot of methods that are completely automatic where we are not interested in a human needing to be in the loop. Um, this example is a very simple example designed by the statistician Anscombe in the 70s, but it shows why sometimes summary statistics alone don't tell you the whole story. These are four data sets that are designed to have exactly identical statistics, but clearly when a human looks at them and sees the full complexity of the data set, we see that, in fact, these are not identical. One is a very standard distribution. All one has an outlier that causes the slope to be a little different than what we see from the stats. And then, of course, we have the pernicious case where we have a radically different situation than what those statistics might um, convey. So there is this question of, well, if people do need to see the details, let's try to use the visual system to do it. So speaking of the visual system, there's this idea that we have a visual representation. And what we're trying to do with these representations is something very specific. Whenever possible, we're trying to use human perception rather than cognition because you have somewhat limited internal mental resources and we want you to use them for doing other things, like the science of interest. So here's a nice example. This is perhaps familiar to many people in this room, where if you have a bunch of numbers, it's hard to actually quickly tell what's going on if you draw a picture such that you have nodes and you are in this case mapping certain values to colors, then some things can jump out at you and you can start to find things like maximal values, minimal values, get a gist of the average quickly, as opposed to actually going through and reading those numbers. Now, another really crucial word here is task. That there is a specific reason that you are drawing this picture. Because there's many, many pictures you might draw and they support different kinds of uh, tasks in different ways. So it's not ever just about the data. It's also what questions are you asking with that data. And then here's a crucial word here, more effectively. So what does that mean? What is better? Uh, a fair amount of this talk, particularly near the end, we'll be talking about this question of how can you validate any of these methods and decide when you're actually helping a human do this thing more effectively. There's various other aspects of the definition that I'm not going to get into too much today. Um, questions of interactivity, of resource limitations that are not just about computational speeds, but also about human perception, and things like displays. How many pictures do you have available to you? But one more implication of this definition before I move on is that you can think about a design space of alternatives of what sorts of drawings could you create. And a key thing is that this space is enormous. And it has got a lot of trade-offs built in, where making certain things better will make other things worse. And the, one of the main reasons I'm giving this talk here to this audience is to try to help you learn from some of the experiences of his community, because it turns out that many, many possibilities in this design space don't work. They don't actually effectively communicate what you want because of some of the ways that human perception is um, actually works. So what you want to avoid is just randomly trying things because that will take a long, long time. Uh, so we want to help you avoid some of our own past mistakes because there's been quite a lot of work in the last 20 years where we now have some guidelines for what works and what doesn't. Now these are not set in stone tablets from the mountaintop. We continue to evolve these guidelines. Um, there's a whole class of work where we have very problem-centered work where we try to solve user problems and then sort out of our guidelines which ones worked and which ones actually need refinement. Um, what this typically means is even if you have a fairly informed process of what you think might work, it's usually an extremely good idea to build in to your development time this idea that you will need to iteratively refine your tool and actually try it out, see what works and what doesn't. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is go through a few principles um, of some ideas that you might be able to take home and even apply, 
about how is it that you could design viz systems. Um, and this ranges from understanding something about uh, the types of data and the ranks of different visual channels to constraints on using color to convey complex information to talking about some issues about 2D versus 3D um, and questions about when might you use immersive displays or when might you not do that. A lot of interesting issues about staring at things versus remembering what you saw before and then coming back to this question of how do you validate that any of this stuff actually worked. So to start out, um, let me give you a vocabulary of data types in a way that's going to be useful for talking about visualization. So at the very beginning, I'm going to divide this up into, let's think about tables of data and then networks and spatial data. Within tables, let's think about just plain categorical data. Uh, so a nice example is this. We have fruit, we have apples and oranges, and we can tell these things are different. But as opposed to ordered data where you actually have some implicit built-in ordering. So a nice example of data that is ordered but not actually quantitative, uh, and I'm going to call that ordinal data, is t-shirt sizes, which is that everyone agrees that medium t-shirts fall between small and large, but it's not a meaningful mathematical question to say what's a large minus a medium t-shirt. So we don't actually do mathematics on them, but there is an implicit ordering. And then there's also quantitative data where we can actually do full-on arithmetic. We can do things like, say, 23 inches minus 17 inches is a meaningful question. And so what I want to do is to always get you to think every time you're thinking about data, is it just categorical or is there an intrinsic ordering to it? Because that's a fundamental question in terms of then how do you encode that data to a human. Now, one of the data sets that's of most interest to this audience is network data, where you're not thinking just I have data items, but I have relationships between data items, and let's think of these as links. So I'll use nodes and items interchangeably, and then I'll talk about links in between. And you can think of these actually as links in between columns of that table. And then finally, I'm not going to talk a huge amount about this today, but there is data that is spatial where there is some intrinsic position in space from uh, the measurements themselves, so it's not an abstract data set. And I'll be making various points about some differences between abstract data sets that are not implicitly spatial and spatial data where you're already given some kind of spatialization that's meaningful to humans. Okay. So that's our idea of data types. Now, where are we going with this? There's this idea of visual encoding. You know, how is it that we draw a picture that's meaningful to a person? And what I want to bring you through is this process of analyzing various visual encodings. I'll start out with these simple ones, but we'll progress to more complex ones, where what we're trying to think is, what data is it showing, and how is it doing that? And so, well, what's going on here? I want to analyze these in terms of what I'm going to call marks and channels. And this is a fundamental set of um, building blocks that we use to make visual encodings. So what are these marks and channels? This goes back to the French semantician Bertin. It's been a major thread in his research for the last um, 20, 25 years. And so there's this way of analyzing how do we show data where the first idea is that there's a mark. So a mark is just some geometric primitive. In zero dimensions, it's a point. In one dimension, it's a line. In two dimensions, it's an area. So think of this as a conveyor of information and you can have a channel which is controlling the appearance of these marks. And there's spatial position, whether it's horizontal or vertical, or actually both in two dimensions. There's the use of color. There's things like orientation and tilt. There's size. Um, there's shape. So, you know, size is something that can be either um, uh, length or area or even volume. So we have these ways to control appearance of marks, and we have these marks. So what does this give us? So now let's go back and actually start analyzing these in terms of these marks and channels. So simple bar chart, what are we doing? The mark is a line, and the channel is vertical spatial position, and we're encoding one abstract data dimension. Sometimes these are called dimensions or attributes or variables, uh, a lot of different words for those. Okay, what's going on with the scatter plot? Well, we see that we're still using spatial position, but now we're using horizontal and vertical position, and our mark is no longer a line, our mark is a point. Okay, now what? Well, now we could say let's add an additional visual channel of color to what we had in the previous scatter plot. So now we're encoding three abstract dimensions. We're still using point marks. And now with this color size coded scatter plot, we've got four data dimensions. We've, we've added size as a visual encoding channel. And again, we're still using point marks. Now, okay, fine, that was bar charts and scatter plots. Beyond that, where is this taking us? Well, 
A key idea is that these visual channels actually do have rankings in terms of um, perceptual accuracy, and I'll get into how we constructed these in just a few slides. But the, the important point I want to make is that some visual channels are intrinsically ordered at a perceptual level. And visually, they communicate to you information about how much and magnitude. And also, intrinsically, there are visual channels that don't communicate how much. They're much more of a distinguishing thing. So think of them as the what channels. So this question is, do you want to use a how much channel or a what channel? And so what are these how much channels? Well, this is actually a lot of them. It's things like spatial position. In fact, you can even distinguish between whether you've got an aligned scale or an unaligned scale. It's things like length, um, orientation, size. Um, these are actually in an order in here, and I'll get into that in a minute. There's things like how much curvature. Um, size in terms of volume is actually harder to perceive than size in terms of either one-dimensional or two-dimensional area. <coughs> And then we're going to actually separate color into a few different dimensions. There's the luminance lightness of going from black to white, color saturation of going from, say, white to red through pink, and even things like the density of a pattern. So these are all visual channels that intrinsically communicate order. And in contrast, there's other visual channels that communicate questions about what something is, not how much of something do you have. And this includes the region of space in which you put it. And the part of color that you probably normally think about when you think color, which is hue, like is it purple or blue or green, um, things like shape and things like pattern. Now there's one more nuance here, which is, well, these marks, what does the mark mean? Are you using the mark to mean an item, or in our case, a node? Or could the marks themselves communicate a link? Um, and there's two major ways of using marks to communicate links. One that you see often in these node link graphs that are common in cytoscape is to actually have a connection between two things. Another is to actually have containment um, or nesting, where what you're showing is an area mark to show some kind of hierarchical relationship. So those of you who are familiar with things like tree maps, that's the visual encoding that's being used there. Now, there's a few things to notice here. One is that this, there is actually an ordering here. And things near the top of the lists are more effective, perceptually speaking, than things near the bottom of the list for the how much and the what channels. One key thing is the spatial position, whether we think of that as unaligned or aligned, or in terms of what region of the plane something's being drawn in, these are at the very top of the list. So spatial position, first of all, works for both how much and what, and it's actually the most effective one. This is going to have all kinds of cascading implications. The other thing to notice is that these are pretty much disjoint for the other visual channels. So this question of, well, what visual channel should I use to encode something, it depends a lot on whether it's ordered data or categorical data. And that motivates that little taxonomy of data types that I presented at the beginning. So it matters a lot to understand and match well the type of data to the visual channel you're going to use. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of the interesting issues about the display of networks that comes down to how are you actually showing links with visual marks. Um, and networks are a special case of these general principles of how do you visualize data in general. Um, and it's useful to think about this in the larger context of how do we visually encode. Now, some of the very earliest work in visualization from Doc McKinley um, was this idea that we should be careful to actually match. So the things that are most important in your data are actually visually encoded with the most perceptually appropriate channels. Um, now, so when I simply asserted on this previous slide that there was a vertical ordering, that stuff near the top was more effective than others, how did I come up with that? Um, and the answer is there's a number of different ways we can think about perceptual goodness. Um, and I'm going to talk about four of them, accuracy, discriminability, separability, and pop-out. So let me go through those. So when I say accuracy, if I had to pick a single one, this would probably be the most crucial, which is when the human actually attempts to perceive some sensation, what happens in terms of the perceptual phenomenon versus the experience in your head? Um, and some of the very fundamental work was done by Stevens um, in the early half of the tw uh, 20th century, um, who could characterize human response. So this is this area of um, 
perceptual and cognitive psychology of psychophysics, which is what happens as we respond to perceptions. And there's this interesting phenomenon, which is fundamentally there's a power law. We react to various phenomena depending on which of our sensory modalities we're using. Um, and there's this nice state of affairs that we have very linear response to length. So we can very accurately perceive things like length. And there's some phenomena where we have super linear response to it. Um, for example, brightness, um, or actually black and white lightness and color saturation, and even things like uh, tangles of electric current in your fingers, you have an extremely super linear response to. And some things we have a sublinear response to where even as you double the phenomenon, we don't actually perceive double that. Um, and that includes things like area, also a bunch of things about sound um, and brightness. So obviously, we're going to focus here much more on the visual perception aspects, not on things like touch and sound and all that. Um, but even within the visual, these different channels actually have different um, power law exponents in terms of how we respond to them. So we can just go through and think systematically about how accurately can we actually perceive something. And a key thing is spatial position in terms of length. We perceive very, very accurately. So let's look at an example of that. Um, I mentioned there's this difference between spatial position unaligned and position aligned with common scale. And most visualizations exploit this. Um, and you can actually go back to some core um, psychophysical experiments to try to understand why this is. So if I just show you two bars, and I say, are these roughly the same length? Um, and I don't actually give you a scale. This is actually kind of a hard perceptual task to figure out the answer to. Um, if I add a frame of the same size around both of them, then it's actually pretty easy. Um, and as Cleveland pointed out, the reason for this comes back to Weber's law about how the human visual system works, which is all in terms of relative judgments. So one takeaway fact is almost everything you perceive is a relative judgment rather than an absolute one. And this tends to have some cascading implications. And so in this case, we actually can't make a very good relative judgment here because the size difference between these is not too huge. It turns out to be about one in nine, whereas the size of these white rectangles actually varies by quite a bit. That's about one in two. So that's an easy perceptual judgment. And so a common frame is one way to allow that kind of simple judgment. The other is simply to align both of those into a common frame. Um, so that's an example of how aligned spatial positions easier to perceive than unaligned ones. Now, accuracy is not the only thing we might care about. Um, another one, for example, is how many steps can we distinguish? And this is not a good or a bad thing. Um, you, it's not that it's always better to have more steps. Um, line width is actually a very effective way to encode data, but it does have a limited number of bins or levels or steps. At some point, if you make a line too fat, it doesn't get perceived as a line anymore. Suddenly, it's actually a full-on polygon. But here's an example of telecommunications um, bandwidth in Europe from a few years ago, where line width is very effective at dis discriminating between three major categories. But if you had 27 categories, then line width would probably not be quite your best bet there. Now, you might think, OK, fine, yes, I knew that. You can't have lines that are too fat. I would never make an error like that. Um, there is an error that a lot of people make very frequently with the use of color, which is confusion about how many different categorical colors can you show. Um, and many people wish that the answer was a couple dozen. But sadly, that is not the answer. Um, so it turns out that from the point of view of human ability to distinguish small patches of color that are not spatially contiguous with each other but scattered all about, the answer is really somewhere around half a dozen, maybe up to 10 or 12 if you're extremely lucky. And keep in mind that includes the background and any kind of a neutral color. Um, so here's an example out of the biological literature that falls into this pitfall, um, where what they say is, you know, look, here's our legend where we've got the chromosomes on the mouse. We're going to give each of these a different color. And then we're going to show you where they actually fall over on the human chromosomes. But the problem here is that even though you can actually tell the difference between eight and nine when they're right next to each other, what we can't do is very systematically tell. We can maybe get about one or two of all these different greens that we're able to really tell apart here. You know, For example, this red and that red. Again, we just have this general percept of the red stuff. So if you go through, you might find that you're able to pick out maybe about six-ish, eight-ish colors, but you definitely can't pick out 20 plus. Um, so this is maybe one of the most common errors made, is wishful thinking about the number of categorical colors that we can distinguish. Because even though you can distinguish two colors that are very, very similar when they're right next to
not when they're scattered all about and you're using it for categorical data. Another important principle that a lot of folks don't think about is this question of when do the visual channels, when can they be perceived separately versus having them integrated together into a common percept. So going along here, we have a nice case on the left, spatial position and hue. So what I've done here is I've got two different um, abstract data dimensions and I'm encoding them using two different visual channels and it's great. I can either tell apart there's the left group from the right group and I can also tell apart there's black stuff and red stuff. So these are fully separable, but we have managed to encode two different data dimensions using two different visual channels. Now let's think about another case. Um, here we start to see a bit of interference, which is that for the big blobs, you can see purple versus red, and for the small ones, it's actually quite hard to distinguish. And this is because there's an interaction between size and color. The smaller that something is, the less able you are to actually perceive its color. So it turns out you have far less ability to discriminate colors as the size of what you're encoding gets smaller. So we can kind of see two groups, but not really so well. Now how about this next case? What we said is, aha, I'm going to encode using the visual channels of width and height. But there's a problem here, which is that what you're seeing is area. And so really, what you're seeing is not two different possible groups. You're seeing three groups. You're seeing little stuff, you're seeing big fat stuff, and you're seeing long skinny stuff. And so your visual system has made three groupings, whereas you might have been trying to encode two completely different variables. And now we have a really pernicious case here, um, which is one of these what not to do. So many of you might have been tempted to think that on the computer you specify color with R and G and B. And so can I treat each of these as a separate channel in which to encode information? And my answer to you is no, don't do that. There is major interference because what you're perceiving is color, not separately red and green. So I can tell you that I carefully actually designed this diagram where I have different amounts of red and different amounts of green and two different groups. But it doesn't matter even if I tell you this, you can't see that. Instead, you see these four different colors. So we have these interesting cases of where we have to take into account separability versus integrality when what you want to do is to have separable dimensions to visually encode separate data dimensions, then make sure you're using separable channels. And sometimes you might actually want to use these integrated channels, and you might want color rather than hue versus saturation versus lightness, or you might actually want to use area. But be careful that you're not doing the wrong thing where you think you're using something separable, but actually you are using these visual channels that are automatically integrated um, at a level of your brain that either is difficult or impossible to actually untangle. So that's a match that's important. Now, there's one more phenomenon I want to mention, which is this idea of visual pop-out. So it turns out that these visual channels um, are something that we've got huge amounts of parallel processing in our brains. So what happens is all of you have noticed there is a red dot and they see a blue dots. So that's not surprising. There's not that many dots. You would notice that just about as fast if I showed you a thousand blue dots with just one red dot in there. And it turns out that your brain is actually processing this in parallel and that regardless of the number of distractors, certain things will pop out at you. And what's really fantastic is that there's many visual channels that do this. Um, color's by far not the only one. We can get pop-out effects from um, orientation and size and even subtle things like um, shading. Um, clearly, we're getting it for black and white, shape, proximity. Um, now, I will mention there are a few channels that don't have visual pop-out. Um, one of them is parallelism. So you actually have to go through and serially search to find that there is one set of parallel lines amidst all these slightly tilted lines. So it's not that every single channel has pop-out, but many, many of them do. And so you might think, great. I've got a bunch of visual channels, there's this pop-out effect, so maybe I could design my visualization so that I can have exactly the right thing pop out in a way that I can switch around between. But unfortunately, there is a very hard limit on this as well. Um, typically, in most cases, you only get pop-out on one channel at once. So once you try to combine, and once I tell you find the red dot amidst red and blue dots and squares, now we're down to a serial search where you're actually you're in something where you can find this fairly easily when I've only got 20 distractors. If I suddenly I gave you 1,000, the amount of time it would take you to find the red dot would go way up. Um, now, what is true is that this question of how quickly do you get pop-out effects and how strong they are 
you can think of it as actually depending on the amount of difference of the item from the surroundings. So in this case, you can still find the red dot amidst red squares, but it's not as fast as the red pops out from blue because the circle, a filled in circle compared to a filled in square are relatively similar compared to the colors of red and blue here. Um, so there's quite a bit more detail about this. Chris Healy has a very nice page, if you're curious, um, that's got links to a lot of the perceptual literature with a few hundred references. Um, so this is a, a great um, resource for those who are interested in these questions of particularly pre-attentive processing, which is the big word for pop out. Now let me give you an example, now that we've gone through a few of these channels and questions of accuracy and the different ways we can measure channels, and look at something that probably a lot of you have seen, which is the heat map. And let's think about the implications of what I've just said for this particular visual encoding of data, where what we're doing is we're taking a very small mark and using color to encode a quantitative value. Um, and if you think back to those lists of rankings I showed, which was that spatial position is actually more highly ranked than color in terms of our ability to accurately perceive, then you might think, huh, maybe it would be interesting to think about using spatial position instead of color to try to encode some similar data. So here's an example of um, something we proposed, the curve map versus the heat map, which allows you to do more high precision judgments. Um, and specifically, the idea is, well, we know from this theory of channel rankings that it should be easier to get high accuracy perception for these framed line charts than for colored boxes. And so there's some nuances you can see here that are harder to see there. And of course, it's a trade-off, which is that we're using somewhat more pixels here. And this gets back into the space of design and trade-offs. Um, but there's some things we're able to see in terms of things like, well, these shapes really are very similar, whereas there's some other shapes that are not nearly so similar that are a little harder to discriminate if we just get strips of colored boxes. Um, there's a system called Pathline that proposed using this um, for doing some pathway analysis, um, in this case, showing some data from yeast. Now, so that's just one example. Let me now go on to another principle, which is these questions of 2D and 3D. So, and what I'm rather grandiosely calling the dangers of depth. Um, there's this question of, I talked about spatial position for my rankings, but I didn't actually mean all possible spatial positions. I meant planar, two-dimensional spatial position, and I specifically don't mean 3D depth when I talk about high accuracy of perception. And so let me point out something that's important, which is every, a lot of people might think, oh, we live in three dimensions. And the answer is, well, yes and no. From a perceptual point of view in terms of human vision, there's a big difference between the image plane that you see in front of you. Think about there's the world, and then if the world were actually being drawn onto a glass plate in front of you. There's a lot of information you can see on the image plane. Um, but then if you think about a ray going out from your eye into a scene, everything along that ray is actually all drawn on the same spot on that image plane. So there's information about what's hidden behind other things that you can't easily see. Now it's true that if you move your head, suddenly you can resolve some of those occlusion relationships, but some things you'd have to move physically very far away um, in order to actually see what's hidden behind other things. So it turns out there's a lot of things you can very quickly see by moving your eyes, and then other relationships in 3D are much more difficult to see. But there's other stuff going on in three dimensions as well. Um, this problem of occlusion, of certain things being hidden behind other things. Um, so it's true that if you're seeing something like, here's a classic 3D layout of a network, um, if you're allowed to spin it around, you can resolve some of those occlusion relationships. But then what you're making the person do is spend that time to actually spin that around. So there's a time cost. And there's also a certain level of cognitive load cost from remembering what you saw before and internally synthesizing that structure in your head. And the more complex the picture is, the more that actually raises difficulties. Um, now, there's another issue with 3D, uh, which is this problem of perspective distortion. So many of you, when you think of perspective, might think you know one of the crowning achievements of the Renaissance was our ability to draw correct three-dimensional pictures in space. And from an artistic point of view, that was a great accomplishment. But an interesting thing to think about with this perspective distortion is if you are showing this kind of gradual foreshortening of things getting smaller and smaller in the distance, any attempt to encode information with size has just gotten obliterated. So this very high accuracy 
ability to do a lot of perception of the plane goes away once you start using 3D encoding. So this is a fairly early, and I'm happy to say not too much duplicated paper, where they were actually laying things out in a ground plane and using size coding um, in a way that actually was fairly ineffective. There's actually one more somewhat subtle problem with 3D that is specific to computers, um, which is it's really hard to read the labels as soon as you go into 3D, because once you tilt directly off that image plane, the carefully, carefully designed fonts that make fantastic use of pixels suddenly start becoming very, very jagged. Um, if you're curious about that issue, um, there's a nice paper from um, the Toronto group that actually talks about what are some ways of trying to make this a bit better once you go to a true 3D display. But the short answer is as soon as you tilt off the image plane at all, suddenly text is a lot harder to read. And of course, text is often what makes a visualization from a picture into something that you use to do something useful. Um, labels reading is crucial in scientific use. So let's actually give an example. Um, if I'm so against 3D, well, what's the alternative? Um, there's often cases where doing the obvious thing in 3D is not the right answer, but doing something more subtle um, can actually give you better results. So let's take this example of time series data. So this is the what not to do figure out of this paper. Um, and what they said is, well, the obvious thing, if you've got some time series graph, in this case, it happens to be um, the amount of power used in a building over time. Um, and there's certain patterns we can see. You know, Late at night, there's no one in the building. Then during the day, people are in it, power goes up. And then the power usage goes down. You can start to see less power is used in the summer than in the winter. We're actually going from January to December. And this is the time of day. Um, so there's some large scale patterns you can see. But there's a lot of information that's basically hidden here with this 3D extruded view where we just took these time series data and put them together in 3D. And what gets brought up is that often the data that you are given is not the right data to draw the picture of. And one of the more interesting parts of visualization is the part where you take your original data set and then do a series of transformations to derive other data such that when you draw that picture, it's actually informative to the users. So the example in this paper was that they said, all right, let's take these time series and let's actually cluster them. So our derived data set will be a much smaller set of high-level clusters. And then we can have multiple linked views where we'll draw a representative for each cluster. Um, and we'll link that to a view that's very good for showing you temporal patterns. That's a calendar. This is actually a Dutch calendar. So it's starting out with Monday um, through Friday and then weekends on the bottom for Sundays and then um, months January through December. And what's nice about this is we are able to see with high precision a lot of interesting patterns. Like most power usage is on what we'll call a typical weekday during the winter. That's these days here. Um, we certainly see that on the weekends, there's almost nobody in the building. But then there's these phenomena like, well, OK, we see there's less people, less power being used in the summers. We even start to see, aha, Fridays during the summers, there's few enough people there that there's significantly less here. Um, and then we start to see, oh, OK, well, here's some days where there's really not that many people. Oh, it's the days in between Christmas and New Year's. Fine. And then there's this interesting one here, which is, what is this red outlier here? What is December 5th? Um, and you look at December 5th on here, and we see there's quite a bit of people at work, and they all go home an hour early. It turns out that in the Netherlands, Santa Claus Day is where you go home an hour early on Friday, December 5th. Um, this is a phenomenon that you would not see in that 3D extruded view. So, this kind of question of do some transformation to the data such that you can draw a picture often with multiple views linked together um, that can actually be more effective than simply saying let's just go ahead and add that third dimension. So the point of the dangers of depth is that if you're using three dimensions for abstract data, you want to be very careful. If you actually have true three-dimensional spatial data in particularly things like, you know, protein structures folded up, then it matters. Then you do need to show the person's three-dimensional structure. And then even though 3D has costs, the benefits are worth it. But if you're encoding an abstract data set, you should be extraordinarily careful to justify the use of 3D. Um, so the Viz community did start out with great enthusiasm about 3D graphics. We were all happy to have graphics cards. We all had our SGIs. Um, and we did a lot of these 3D network layouts, and we systematically found a lot of problems. And there were a lot of empirical studies that were run that shows that there are some problems. Here we have a kind of typical, one of the last of the old style, let's just draw it in 3D network views. And there's a lot of things that are very hard to read off of this picture. Um, 
One issue is that you particularly want to be aware that 3D is the worst for things like point clouds, and the second worst is network, where you have points that are simply connected up by lines. Because there's a lot of cues you have for 3D in the real world, like shadows and shape from shading and familiar size, that are not available to you for resolving some depth information. Um, now, another question you might think is, ah, what about those immerf immersive displays like caves? When might I want to use those? Um, and the answer is, again, if you have abstract data, be very, very careful. Um, so my tagline is pixels are precious. And in particular, any time that you have to make a choice between resolution and immersion, if you're dealing with abstract data, you probably want to pick resolution. Um, typically, if you're looking at abstract data, the use of stereo and this kind of immersive sense of presence are not the most crucial thing. Um, and it's also the case that typically, if you're looking at these immersive displays, you're paying some penalty in terms of the ability to actually see the maximal number of pixels. And you see more pixels by a standard desktop display than with one of these more exotic immersive displays. Um, so typically, you always want to pick pixels. These are the scarcest resource that you run out of the most quickly <coughs> when you're designing a visualization system. Um, and there's also issues like, you know, what about the part where you actually have to go look things up in the database and check your mail and, and browse various other tools? It's much harder to use those in an immersive environment than in a desktop environment. So it's not very common at all that you could actually justify VR for these kinds of abstract data sets. And again, this is fairly old work because happily there hasn't been too much more along these lines. Okay, what about another, um, maybe more subtle point about principles? And this one is that eyes beat memory. And so the principle is that typically when we're designing a visualization, what we're trying to do is substitute something external to the human brain as opposed to internal memory resources. And an important principle is that it's very easy to make comparisons by simply moving your eyes between two views that are side by side on the same page. And it's actually much harder <laughs> to compare the memory of what you saw before that's stored internally to what you are looking at now. One can do that, but it has some cognitive load. And so there's some really interesting implications for when is animation an effective visual encoding versus when is it not. And so a lot of people tend to think animation must be great because there's these amazing Disney movies where they use animation and they're very, very compelling and evocative. But you have to be careful there because these movies have been extremely carefully designed with choreography so that one thing is happening at a time and your eye is looking in the right place in the frame. So, you know, things don't suddenly happen. There's a little bit of movement before so that you know that the arm is going to move in a particular direction so that you are looking at that. There's some great papers by folks from Pixar like John Lasseter about doing that. So animation is great for choreographed storytelling. And it's also particularly great for just transitions between two states, like blink comparators for when stars are moving in the sky. This is how they found Pluto. So if you only have two states, flipping in between them is extremely effective. But it's kind of tricky when lots of stuff changes everywhere, because then your eye is not actually able to know where to look. And so then you might consider some other methods or techniques, and one of them is instead of doing something liter literal where something that changes over time you're showing with changes over time, you might have something that changes over time that you're showing with different regions of space. So here's an example of this small multiples technique where, and this is a, a, an example from Cerebral, which is, a, which is a Cytoscape plugin that we made it several years ago, um, where we're actually showing different versions of the same spatial layout, where we've got one instance of the graph for each experimental condition, and then they're colored differently by, um, and so that we're able to show experimental data from a bunch of these different conditions. Um, and so in this case, we're actually able to start seeing patterns where things start out pretty much the same at hour one and hour 24, but in the middle, when there was um, unchecked growth, we actually saw some very different regulation patterns versus when um, they were actually using an experimental drug on the top row versus no drug intervention on the bottom row. So the interesting question here is, what would this have looked like if I showed you an animation? Um, and what's very tricky here is, if you attend to any particular dot, right, like now it's white, now it's orange, now it's red. So locally, I can start to read out what's happening, but I've completely lost track of all the other things that are going on in other regions of the screen. And this is actually only a few frames, and what you're seeing is that still your intermediate mental buffers are getting blown away because there's so many things happening all over the screen. So it's actually very hard to track compared to the ability to simply move your eyes back and forth quickly 
so that you're not using so many internal mental resources. So the, the short answer is there's some really interesting reading where Barbara Tversky out of Cognitive Psychology did a meta-review of a lot of interfaces where animation was claimed to help and found that when she actually properly controlled for the variables of how much information was shown, that really animation didn't help. And there's a lot of cases where carefully chosen segmented images that your eye can move back and forth between quickly are going to be more effective than animations in a lot of cases. So there are things animation is fantastic for, particularly transitions between states. So animated transitions from one view to the next tend to be very effective. But just showing a large amount of data with animation, if there's a lot happening between every frame and there's many frames, is something that you might want to think twice about. Now, moving away a bit from these questions that are purely about visual encoding and interaction techniques, um, there's actually multiple levels of design that you might want to think about when you're thinking about visualization. Um, and a model I proposed a few years ago tries to explicitly separate out four different kinds of design questions and thus four different kinds of validation techniques in terms of how to classify all possible ways to answer the question of is it good, is it helping. Um, and so what you want to do is think about these four different levels and one is even characterizing the problem. What do people need to do? And the threat is that you might misunderstand what problem people actually have, either because you never talked to them or you assumed that their first answer was the right answer. Um, it turns out talking to people is necessary but not sufficient. Um, but it's much better than never talking to them at all. So there's this question of whether you actually understand that a set of users has a particular need for a visualization tool. And then there's another very interesting set of questions about have you selected the right abstraction? And I alluded to this in terms of this question of when would you have to create derived data sets or transform your data so that what you're drawing the picture of is actually helpful. Um, and this is a question of do you understand the data abstraction? Do you understand the task abstraction? Have you transformed from a very domain specific task to something that's actually an abstract task you can address through visualization? And then there's this question of visual encoding. Are you actually showing something in a way that works with the human perceptual system? And then finally, there's a whole set of questions about have you designed a good algorithm? You know, and a threat here is that, well, maybe your code is too small compared to a different algorithm. So these are very, very different levels of design and they have different threats to validity. Um, so just walking through these in a bit more detail, um, at the problem characterization level, what we're typically doing is we're saying, is there something that I think I can address with a visualization system? Sometimes it's letting people do things they've never done before, but very, very often it's take some existing workflow and speed it up. Um, and that's a very, very common case for the use of viz. So how would you figure out if you got that right? Um, well, one immediate thing you could do is actually go and talk to your target users. This might sound trivially obvious, but it's remarkable that a number of people don't do this. Um, um, a very downstream way after you've gone off and implemented the whole system is you might actually see, so are people using it? Um, this is, of course, a very noisy signal. There's all kinds of great systems that aren't adopted and vice versa, but it is some level of signal. So what about this abstraction phase? This is going from a very domain-specific problem to something that's more generic, um, where you want to think not just about a specific biological problem, but it might turn out that a very specific biology problem is, in fact, at the abstract level, very similar to a problem out of, say, finance. And that what you want to think is then in terms of these abstractions, where you're thinking at a very high level about what are tasks, right? It might be that you're comparing things or finding outliers or trying to characterize a distribution or find correlations or filter things or do some kind of browsing because you can't do search because you don't know precisely what you're looking for. So you can think about operations or tasks at a very generic <coughs> level. And I've already talked a little bit about some of the data abstractions that you can choose. Is your data basically tables where you've got items and columns of attributes? Do you have links between them with networks? Is your data intrinsically spatial? And critically, do you need to do these transformations to derive new data such that when you draw that picture, it helps? And there's some interesting questions about understanding when did you get this part right? Um, and it's typically crucial to actually watch how people use your tools in the field in order to understand whether you got the task abstraction right. Um, then there's designing these techniques of visual encoding and interaction. That's what I've been focused on in this talk, but this is only one piece of the larger visualization context. And I'm going to distinguish between two key things. One is how do you draw the picture, 
And the other is how do they manipulate the picture? So visual encoding and interaction. And I've got these two together because for many visualization methods, they are intrinsically tied to each other. So for simple things like a bar graph, it's all about the visual encoding and there's not much interaction. But for a lot of the more sophisticated systems, the way that you draw the picture and the way that you interact with it are quite intertwined. Um, so there's a lot of ways to validate this. You know, one is to make sure you're not directly violating known principles. One is to actually do some analysis of the result pictures, whether that's a quantitative analysis in terms of known metrics or a qualitative analysis in terms of let's discuss the result pictures and see if you can actually see the phenomena that we're claiming. Um, and this is also the place where it is very interesting and legitimate to do typical controlled experiments with human users where you're measuring how long it takes them to do on a given abstract task. Um, now, then at the algorithm level, of course, from a computer scientist's point of view, this is the most well-studied problem of all, which is how do you actually validate whether an algorithm's good? Well, you can immediately do complexity analysis, and then downstream, you can start to have a bunch of benchmarks for not human time and memory, but system time and memory. Um, so a key thing is that you do want to make sure that you match up your techniques for the level of design that you're really aiming at in your system. So one common set of problems in visualization papers is a mismatch here. So for example, if you've invented a new visual encoding for data and you've proposed a new network layout, and the only thing you tell me is how fast your system draws that picture, you haven't addressed the problem of whether that drawing is helping the human. Um, so it's great to discuss algorithm performance in terms of system timings, but for visual encoding, you need to start thinking about is it helping the human. Uh, another very common problem is that people misunderstand the abstraction that they need to use. And so they do one of these lab studies where they measure human time and error for using a particular visual encoding. But that human is doing the task that you told the human to do. And so it's not a good way to test whether or not you actually got the abstraction right. This is where you want to go and actually start to observe usage in the field. So there's more details about this in the paper if you want to start thinking specifically about for the various methods, when might they be appropriate for these different levels of design. But I'm not going to go into it too much more here. So to recap some of the things I talked about, I was focused on a lot of principles that you can use to think about the design, mostly a visual encoding, a little bit about interaction, and also this question of validating against the right threat. Now, there's a lot more information about this if you're curious. Um, the slides for this talk are on my website. Um, a number of resources, including lots of papers and also my entire grad course on visualization is also on that site. Um, in this talk, I actually only talked about a piece of it, which is principles. And I only alluded to some questions of techniques. What are the methods, the techniques that you could actually use? That would be a whole other talk, which sadly I don't have time to give today. Um, but if you're curious, there is a single book chapter that goes into a lot of this in more detail. And in about a year or so, there will finally, finally be um, a textbook coming out that goes into all of this in a lot more detail. So thank you. Uh, way in back. Any suggestions on how to deal with color blindness or design threats? Yes. So the short answer is, um, when possible, if you're doing any kind of a color ramp where you're comparing between basically two different things, so two hues, in many ways the worst possible hues to pick are red and green. But of course if there's domain conventions, as there are in biology about some of the meanings of red and green, you've got a couple of choices. One is that you can try to make sure that you, are, you have different luminance values for the red and the green, so that for example, if you, the simple way to test is if you look at it in black and white, can you tell the difference? Um, but when you're, us when you're doing these kind of saturation coatings like you're doing in heat maps, then in fact that gets a quite a bit trickier. So another answer is to try to actually retrain your users, at least offer multiple defaults so that they don't let only have the choice of red and green. The thing that's actually a bit tricky is colorblind users don't only confuse red and green. Those are the two worst cases, but there's actually quite a bit of colors that people with normal color vision can tell the difference between that people with um, color deficiency problems are going to have troubles with. So at a very, very simple level, the answer is go to VizCheck and actually put the screenshot of your application into VizCheck and it will show you what it looks like to the major forms of color blindness. 
and worry about the two red-green ones. Don't worry about the yellow-blue one because it's a vanishingly small number of people. So worry about the two different cases of the red-green one. So empirically, you know, if you can, avoid in red and green if those are the only two major hues you're using. But in the case of using categorical colors, we'll actually want to have a number of different hues. And if you just rule out red and green, well, you've actually, given that we only had about six or eight colors we could do, you're kind of hobbling yourself a bit. Um, so I, I counsel you to worry much more about things like color ramps between two colors versus using lots of categorical colors. But check it with VizCheck. Yes, James. So uh, you spend a lot of time talking about how once someone's already taken a picture, mm -hmm. how they get information out of it. I wonder what the rankings are like for getting people to look at the figure in the first place. So drawing attention rather than informing them what you have there. Right. Oh, so I can tell you. So one of the visual channels that I specifically chose not to tell you about at all was Blink. So there's a lot of motion channels um, that are extremely highly salient to the point where you can't look away. Um, so, as many of you have noticed on badly designed web pages, it's very difficult to not attend to something that's blinking. So blinking is extremely effective for drawing your attention, so effective that it kind of drowns out a lot of the other channels, so even after you don't want to attend to it, it's hard not to. So there's actually a number of different motion channels um, that I haven't included here. One is, so there's blink. Um, there's actually common motion. So if a group of things are all moving in the same trajectory compared to others, you actually can pre-attentively detect that. Um, it's another. So there's basically the frequency, um, there's the direction of motion. So there's a number of these motion-based channels. Um, so those are probably the strongest ones in terms of drawing attention. My question, though, is, is there a conflict sometimes between, amongst the things that you've talked about already, in static images, I'm writing, making a figure for a paper that I'm publishing. Is there ever a conflict between getting someone's attention and informing them? So there's, 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 a, there's a, something that you could use that would draw their attention to a figure, but it wouldn't inform them. Then if you use a thing that was more informative, no one would want to pay any attention to it. Sure. This is an active subject of debate. There was an interesting paper by Holman et al. Um, about these questions of, you know, what's often called chart junk or glitz of, you know, let me draw the user's attention to things by, you know, having the, the classic example is these Nigel Holmes graph from Time magazine where, you know, instead of just a bar chart, you'd have, uh, you know, a, a chorus girl's leg, actually, as the, the slope of the bar. And so you've got these kind of very glitzy graphs that are using a lot of what, you know, don't exactly follow this kind of visual channel-oriented design principles to do. And so the question is, so do they look at it more and do they rem remember it more months later? So there's some interesting data about memorability versus kind of straight-up efficiency. Um, so, you know, the short answer is certainly different people in the groups have different biases, as you might have guessed from my kind of highly efficiency-oriented arguments. I'm one of the people that's more in the efficiency camp. Um, so there are, I think there's a lot of interesting subtleties to untangle in terms of questions of, you know, long-term memorability of a specific message is typically the case in presentation graphics. Um, to what extent do you want to try to maximize memorability, perhaps at the expense of showing more subtle, nuanced interpretations of your data? So if there's absolutely an only one thing that you want to show them, then maybe it's a little bit safer to have a somewhat glitzy graph. But in general, I would answer you're probably, you could have better things to do with those pixels. Um, so, I mean, another question I've been asked at a different version of this talk is, so what about aesthetics? This is all very kind of efficiency oriented. Where do aesthetics come in? Um, my answer to that is, if you have to think about form and function, when you're designing a visualization, I argue function first and then form. Because if you have something that's efficient and you want to actually make it more aesthetically pleasing, you can work with a graphic designer who knows a bunch of the principles of graphic design that have to do with things like the use of spatial position and color and, you know, making segmentation and grouping and ways of taking something that is functional but ugly and making it prettier is typically something a graphic designer can help you with. If you take something that is absolutely beautiful and not functional, you're kind of done and you have to start from scratch. And so it's much harder to add function to beauty than it has to add some basic aesthetics to function. So I don't think that, that aesthetics and beauty is pointless, but I do think it's probably a mistake to start there for a lot of this kind of functional style visualization design. But in the best of all worlds, you don't have to pick between them. You should have both. 
Other questions? Or perhaps lunch calls? Yeah, thank you. All right, I will let everyone eat some lunch. <laughs>